Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Quincy Institute's uh, panel discussion titled Cooperation or Cold War, Navigating U.S.-China Relations in Times of COVID and Climate Good Change. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the- My name is Trita Parsi. I'm uh, the Executive Vice President of the Quincy Institute, a transpartisan think tank in Washington that promotes ideas that move U.S. foreign policy away from endless war and towards vigorous diplomacy. We favor a national security strategy that is centered on diplomacy and military restraint. In our assessment, one of the greatest challenges facing the United States in the coming decades will not be China per se, but a rush towards an unnecessary Cold War with China. Not just because of the immediate security implications, but also because of the impact such a Cold War will have on our ability to address future pandemics, climate change, and other common threats. Just today, President Trump said that the US could cut off its entire relationship with China in order to punish it. Indeed, US-China relations have deteriorated quite significantly in the last couple of years. President Trump's own national security strategy from 2017 mentions China 23 times, invariably in hostile terms. While China has mishandled the pandemic and certainly is engaging in activities that challenge the United States, the risks and dangers of a Cold War with China is poorly understood in Washington, particularly when it comes to the risks outside of the traditional security sphere. To address these issues, we have a fantastic panel that will be moderated by Rachel Odell uh, from uh, Quincy Institute. And if you haven't already, definitely check out her op-ed together with Stephen Wertheim in the New York Times earlier this week on US-China relations. If you are joining us by Zoom, please use the Q&A function to ask your questions and Rachel will get to those questions towards the second half of the conversation. If you are joining us by YouTube, uh, please use the comment section to ask your questions. So without any further ado, please welcome Rachel Odell, who will introduce the panel and kickstart the conversation. Rachel? Yes, thank you so much, Trita. And I'm grateful to all of you who are joining us and especially to our panelists, who I'd like to introduce now. Uh, we have Deborah Seligson, who's an assistant professor of political science at Villanova University and one of the nation's leading experts in US-China relations around pandemics and climate change. And um, before uh, earning her PhD from UCSD, she had a long career in, the, in NGOs and in government, including serving as environment, science, technology, and health counselor in the US embassy in Beijing from 2003 to 2007, which is when uh, China had its last major coronavirus outbreak, the SARS outbreak in 2003. And then she also served as principal advisor to the World Resources Institute's uh, China Energy and Climate Program in Beijing for several years after that. Um, in addition, we have John Glazer, who's Director of Foreign Policy Studies at the Cato Institute. His research interests include grand strategy, as well as the rise of China, and the role of status and prestige motivations in international politics. So we're grateful to have John, who has a master's from George Mason University in international security and a bachelor's from UMass Amherst. And then we also have Jennifer Wang Bui, who is, the, uh, is a senior policy researcher and Tong Chair in China set Policy Studies at the RAND Corporation. Jennifer uh, recently testified to Congress in February on US-China pandemic uh, relations, China's pandemic response infrastructure and the coronavirus issue and is one of the leading experts on uh, China and US-China uh, cooperation in, in public health and epidemiology. So she has her PhD in epidemiology from George Washington University and her MD from Peking University School of Medicine. So we're very grateful to have all of you here and just want to get to dive right into the conversation so that we can have uh, time also for uh, questions from the audience. So the, the first area they wanna talk about is, is something that Trita alluded to in the introduction that of course US-China relations have really taken a downturn uh, at, at, during this current pandemic crisis. And this uh, not only is the administration and some members of Congress really seeking to blame China for aspects of the outbreak and even proposing punitive retaliation against China, but they're also sort of using this as, as a way to, uh, an opportunity to push forward a more longstanding agenda of competition and uh, full spectrum competition with Beijing. Now, some China hawks such as Senator Marco Rubio have, have said that they don't necessarily want a cold war, but they think that it's a, it's a necessary risk to take because of the importance of, of pushing back on China in these ways. And so 
John, I was wondering if we could start with you and if you could say whether you agree that a new Cold War with China is necessary, that it may, it's, it's a necessary risk to take. Uh, do you think that China fundamentally threatens U.S. interests in a way that requires us to pursue a strategy of containment or full spectrum competition against Beijing? Or is there an alternate way to approach the relationship? You know, I think there's considerable um, uncertainty and differences of opinion about, you know, what precisely China's ambitions are. Um, you know, they may or may not be accurately reflected in the public statements and propaganda of the Communist Party. But I think, you know, when we consider this question, the more important thing to think about is not just ambition, but also capabilities. Um, and when you try to interpret another state's ambitions, you have to look at what they're able to accomplish. And here, I think it's worth mentioning those aspects of and, you know, China's situation that suggests it'll have a more difficult time sort of achieving its ambitions. So it's, you know, the threat inflation on China assumes that, you know, their economy will continue to grow roughly along the trajectory that it has been since uh, the market reforms in the late 70s. And, you know, that's not implausible inherently, but it seems like a bad bet because we know that China's economy is now slowing. Um, which is a major concern and potential weakness for them, both internationally and domestically. You know, they have an aging population, ethnic tensions, rest, restive provinces in the West, um, environmental problems, corruption. You know, they border 14 countries. They're hemmed in by the littoral states. Um, you know, they have considerable challenges, and it depends on how we want to interpret. You know, President Xi has recently centralized power, but, you know, and, and that can be interpreted as some ominous sign that, you know, China is now more bold and assertive and with malign intent, but it could also reflect China's insecurities, uh, concerns about losing control given all these challenges that it faces. And so I think we need to put China in context and understand that, you know, they don't threaten directly U.S national security, and unless you expand the definition of that term um, beyond all recognition. Um, what we need to do is not um, provide ourselves with a um, self-fulfilling prophecy where we make China out to be um, a determined adversary in all ways. Uh, we ignore the aspects of the U.S.-China relationship that are actually mutually beneficial. And it'll lock us into this competition where every action by China has to have a reaction from the United States and vice versa. Um, and I think if we look at the Cold War, we can we can see how, you know the the drawbacks of that kind of strategy. It's extremely costly. It'll distort our perception of our interests. It'll get us into unnecessary conflicts. It'll probably prompt a lot of um, unnecessary defense spending. And it just you know that's. To me, that's a real problem, especially in a context where the pandemic is kind of illustrating for us that you know, the challenges that we face in the 21st century are gonna be different than the ones that we faced in the past. And that means we have to allocate resources differently and um, try to work cooperatively, which requires us to transcend the kind of nationalist impulses that are quite in vogue right now and also almost inherent in this kind of structural face-off between China and the United States. So um, I'm worried about the, the way forward because although there does seem to be some measure of uh, debate, um, unlike a lot of other US foreign policy priorities among elite circles on what to do, um, the politics seem to me to be pretty poisonous at this moment. Thanks. And Jennifer, I was wondering, what's your view on, on maybe this idea that the United States could win a Cold War? And, and, or, or what would be some of the dangers of that mentality, including for global economic supply chains and production networks? Great. Uh, thank you, first of all, to uh, reach out to me. Uh, and I really uh, appreciate this uh, discussion. So when we look at the US uh, foreign policies, uh, even just uh, the last uh, three administrations, we see that in the Bush administration, the Iraq war, the Obama uh, administration with the Syria uh, issues, uh, and now uh, with uh, President Trump, that moving uh, seems to move the uh, emphasis on foreign policy from Middle East to great power. 
uh, uh, discussions. Uh, we have seen the problems with Iraq war with the situation in Syria that is very costly for the US uh, and also doesn't really create a, a peaceful regional uh, consequences. So I want to use that as a trajectory uh, to the U.S.-China discussion, uh, because I think now it's more than ever that U.S. should think about use a more modest uh, and a deliberate uh, uh, approach uh, to foreign policy, and uh, think about you know what is the objective here uh, for the U.S. Uh, in terms of China uh, policy, and uh, what can we do uh, to reach these objectives. And what are, do we have the resources uh, to, to achieve that? So given the long-term uh, strategy, it shouldn't be just a one day's headline uh, or just re react to one uh, party's uh, rhetoric uh, for election. So the long-term uh, Cold War, that whenever we say Cold War, because the US won the last Cold War, we think, okay, so this is another Cold War that uh, US will win. But we may not be that uh, optimistic here uh, because uh, during the Cold War, uh, even at, uh, when Soviet Union at its peak, it was that the GDP is only about 40% of the U uh, US GDP. Um, but China right now, uh, the GDP may very quickly exceed that of U.S. Um, and also uh, U.S. won the uh, Cold War with many allies from both uh, uh, developed countries and, in, and uh, developing countries such as uh, China, Egypt, and so on. Um, but right now, U.S. seems to have a all front, uh, uh, you know, American first uh, policy that can hurt uh, these allies. So when we think of another Cold War, I may not have the same trajectory. Uh, but I really want to bring uh, the discussion to the long-term planning. Um, and in terms of uh, the disruption of the global supply chain, well, certainly, you know, we, we, we talked about the, the good values uh, adding to the supply chain in the last, uh, you know, 18 years, that China actually have increasing proportions of that uh, global su supply chain. And uh, the US-China tensions already putting a lot of uncertainty for other countries uh, to think about the investment. Are they going to invest in 5G or are they you know, using, uh, try to uh, stop the investment using the Huawei? So all of the, these issues put these countries in the middle. And one of the things I heard most from uh, you know, ASEAN countries, uh, uh, is that you know don't let us choose between the two we we, ha we have a uh, china is a economic partner and us is our ally but don't let us choose from between those so i think that's the sentiment out there yeah i think that's a really interesting dynamic and and deborah i was wondering if you could address this global component of it as well because uh, of course the us china cold war would have implications for countries around the world that are not interested in sort of choosing between one side or getting caught in the middle. So what, what do you think countries, including US allies in Europe and in Asia, uh, could do to try to mitigate those, those dynamics or to uh, maybe dissuade uh, US and China from pursuing this kind of uh, intense rivalry and competition? Well, I mean, at the moment, the U.S. isn't particularly listening to its allies, as Jennifer, I think, just said. So um, that's a real challenge. I think if we have um, an election and we have a change of government, we may well have a president that is more willing to listen to allies and work more closely with allies. And frankly, I think there are many... Um, Republicans who had they been the president would have chosen to work with allies as well. So I think we're right now at an extreme end in terms of, you know, where where we're at in terms of our traditional allies. I think it's also important to pick up on a point that John kind of alluded to, which is China doesn't really have a lot of friends in its own region. And so I mean, when Jennifer says, you know, the ASEAN don't want to choose, to some extent, 
I mean, they're trying to do balancing, but they also very much want U.S. friendship, U.S. presence, and that's true of most of China's neighbors, right? So first of all, in terms of sort of thinking about what China's sort of um, sphere of influence is, it's important to remember that it doesn't just have this big group of neighbors to rely upon. So I think the Cold War framing in a lot of ways is not that useful. I don't see that the US and China um, are going to be in one, nor, you know, if we think back to the Cold War, the amount of sort of trade and um, civil society interaction and all the other parts of international interaction between the US and the Soviet Union was very, very low. And whatever the stance of the US government is, the amount of other interaction between the US and China is just plain gonna be much higher. And it is for all of our allies and friends and other countries throughout the world. One statistic that I heard recently that really hit me was that air tra travel globally doubled between 2009 when the H1N1 epidemic hit and today when COVID hit. And an awful lot of that increase in air travel is of course Chinese people traveling around the world and also other sort of the growing middle class in other developing countries like India and Indonesia and elsewhere. So we're so much more integrated that we have to figure out how to work with each other. And returning to the point that John made earlier, the threats that we actually deal with like COVID, like climate change, are all ones that actually will benefit from cooperation. So I think, you know, rhetoric in Washington is one thing, but firstly, business is gonna look for where they can, you know, make profits and follow their supply needs. They're gonna diversify because they've certainly seen new risks here, but that doesn't mean that they're gonna want a fortress America business climate. And for other types of challenges, we really do need to think about how we can best work together and how we can do a lot of, I don't know, to go back to an old Chinese term, self-strengthening, right? Because the US needs its own house to be in order, Rachel. Yeah, thanks. And you know, one, one aspect of this, of this, of course, is that there are ways in which Chinese behavior influences or challenges United States interests. For example, theft of, of US intellectual property, or uh, human rights abuses in, with, within China that you know, the United States has sort of a long tradition and places a strong importance on advocating for human rights around the world. So, so how can the United States best achieve its interests in, this, in these areas and influence China um, in areas where maybe our interests don't align as much? I don't know, John, if you wanna to speak to that. Sure. If I can make a brief point about this question of allies, because I, I don't think it's talked about enough. Um, you know, first of all, there's there's a, probably many reasons why allies have a different threat perception of China than the United States, but two of them jump out at me. Um, one of them, if we see a lack of balancing in the region and that concerns us, it might be fruitful to think about uh, sharing the burden for the defense of some of these countries. Um, you know, if we want a, a, a substantial buffer uh, maybe China and South Korea should begin to take more responsibility for their own security. Uh, but they're underspending because we're the guarantor of their security. Um, the other reason is because they just don't see a threat from China in the way we do. And that should really make us question whether or not we are accurately uh, framing these things. Um, third quick point on the Cold War thing, you know, containment doesn't make sense in this point. It's kind of like, what would we even build this coalition that we can't build because the allies don't agree with us? For what purpose? Um, the logic in the Cold War was that the Soviet system would soon self-destruct and we just needed to hold the line until that happened. That's basically what ended up happening, but that's not gonna be the case with China. Um, on your question with regard to things like IP and human rights, you know, the IP question, uh, it was way worse, I think, than it is now, and it'll probably get better. Uh, that's a function of the fact that China's economy is growing and it will gain an interest in protection of these uh, property rights. Uh, 
Um, um, and, you know, I think a few years ago, 2014 or 2015, it actually set up specialized courts to hear these IP cases. And I think most or all um, of the cases were, were won by foreign companies. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. On human rights, this is a tricky issue. Um, first of all, if we're going to try to mobilize global uh, opinion against China to try to improve its um, human rights uh, behavior, it might help if we stopped engaging in uh, grave abuses of human rights as a matter of routine. Uh, it kind of makes us look hypocritical and it, it uh, disincentivizes China to actually accommodate us on these things. And then one last point. Um, we need to understand the limits of American power. We might wish and hope for uh, democratization in China, for rights for the Uyghurs, for accountability for all these abuses. Um, but that just might be beyond what we are able to manipulate. Um, we've uh, badgered lots of countries about their domestic abuses. And um, it's very, very difficult to change internal systems like that, especially great power like China. And so, you know, we can work multilaterally, we can work through the UN, we can highlight abuses through our free press and so forth. And we can try to lead by example, which is again, as I said, very difficult when we're criticizing China for giving repressive regimes, you know, the technology to increase their repression, you know, maybe we should rethink the policy of um, aiding the Saudis to the hilt, which is one of the most regressive authoritarian regimes in the world, as they commit vicious war crimes against a largely defenseless, um, impoverished population in Yemen. You know, we have to stand up on our own and be an example, and that will actually mobilize global opinion behind us and against China not trying to poke China in the eye and mess around in their internal politics. Great, thanks. And um, I want to move on now to talking a little bit more about the pandemic and US-China relations amidst the pandemic. But before I do, I want to bring in one question from the audience that relates to this conversation. So uh, Will Waldorf asks, if economic interdependence and common threats like pandemics are structural, structural factors pushing against Cold War, does the anti-China banter at home really matter that much? Or is it just cheap political talk in an election year? And you know, this is a this is a recurring feature in U.S. election cycles, uh, bashing on China. It's, it's it's sort of American as apple pie. So, do you think this is is there something that's different this time around, given the pandemic, given um, the change in U.S.-China relations and the trade war, um, or do you think this is and is it likely to have more long-term consequences, or do you think this is something that we can move past after the election? De Deborah or Jennifer, if you want to speak to that. So. I think it's more than cheap talk because it didn't start this year, right? I mean, especially for Trump, he's definitely ramped it up this year, but it, it's been pervasive in this administration from the beginning. So the damage is more than, you know, a few months. And among Democrats in Congress, there's been a lot of resentment about China and trade for a while. So it's not like this was simply on one side of the aisle. There's a lot of hostility on both sides. I mean, I do think that there's this real basis to the frustration if you look at um, the um, the research that's been done showing, you know, that there that the trade, that China's entry into the WTO had much more significant harms to specific communities in the US than economists had been looking at. This is the Otor, Dorn, and Hansen work, sort of showing that it was very specific in terms of localities. And, you know, my own research partners, um, Jack Jung and um, John Cook, and I have looked at sort of how it changed congressional voting and congressional communication. And it's very clear that districts that were specifically hurt by China's entry 
um, the, that Congress has become much more hostile and that that's the real change in the Republican Party because Democrats always had a relatively strong um, anti-trade, um, pro-U.S. domestic labor um, sort of rhetorical stance. Um, this was somewhat mispredicted because what others have shown is that the um, it wasn't the change in actual tariff rates, which had already been low because of the most favored nation state. It was the change in the stability of those tariff rates when you got permanent normal trade relations instead of an annual vote that enabled companies that had been in the US to move to China with confidence about long-term tariff expectations. So economists mispredicted the effect of China's entry into the WTO. And they also tended to look at national averages and not look at community by community. So I think there was this buildup of resentment that the Obama administration then sort of tried to deal with, but they had the whole um, recovery from the global recession to deal with, and the Chinese were not being particularly willing um, negotiators on the other side. And so it kind of got pushed and pushed, and then Trump came in and was very dramatic. So I do think it's going to require that both countries sort of get serious about it in a more mature way and that the Chinese really recognize they are going to have to negotiate sort of seriously, even if a new, new administration comes in on trade. So I think there have been some shifts that um, really do make it more than just cheap talk. I do think that on average, if you look at the people advising Joe Biden, they are people who definitely want to work with China on things like pandemics and climate change and other issues. So I think there's an opportunity also to sort of find success on specific issues while also working on the hard problems, which are really about trade and security. Frankly, things like pandemics should be the easy stuff. And that's what's been so crazy about this current period. I mean, not easy in terms of addressing, but easy in terms of working together collaboratively. Yeah, yeah. The rationale is pretty straightforward that this is a positive sum issue. As I say, it's something where we, we need to work together in order to resolve it successfully. So I, I want to talk more about this. And, and Jennifer, if you could speak to what forms of uh, pandemic uh, collaboration around the pandemic, scientific public health collaboration are taking place right now at either non-governmental or governmental levels between the United States and China? And how is this different than in the past and how it needs to change moving forward? Right, um, so right now they're not a lot uh, at the government level, uh, but I think there's a continuing uh, conversations among the scientists, uh, especially for COVID-19, the Chinese scientists, uh, uh, no matter it's a biomedical or uh, uh, clinical science, they have contributed a lot to the literature on COVID. And that's what most countries are referring to uh, in, in their uh, strategies towards COVID. So that's a contribution. But I want to revert to you know SARS 18 years ago, at the time that uh, China was didn't have a comprehensive surve surveillance or uh, case reporting system yet. Uh, their public health system is mostly these epidemic uh, stations at local level. At the time, China was just uh, thinking about uh, restructure their CDC. They actually chose the uh, US CDC as a model uh, for their restructuring. This is even before SARS, because uh, they used the Shanghai CDC as a model and Shanghai uh, among several countries a model, they chose the US because they thought uh, at the time that US CDC focused on epidemiology, focused on lab science, and they think, okay, this is what US, uh, China can, can learn from. And after SARS, you know, that certainly exposed uh, China's weakness in, in its system. So they uh, really opened up uh, the collaboration and US CDC at the time uh, worked very well with China. And all through these 18 years, they basically work side by side on every single 
epidemics that involves US or China, that including the uh, avian flu uh, 2005, uh, the H1N1 swine flu 2009, and all the way to Ebo uh, Ebola, that's the when China sent in the largest uh, humanitarian effort that, you know, I've ever seen uh, from China uh, to work with, uh, with uh, the US. And after Ebola, the two uh, CDC continue to collaborate and reflect on the global health uh, agenda. And they decide to work together to build the Africa CDC. Uh, and the U uh, USAID has, was working with commerce uh, department in China, who's at the time uh, was in charge of the foreign aid. So this is back in 2015. At that time, it seems that finally that uh, the two countries are starting to collaborate on global health issues. Um, but certainly in the last, uh, since uh, I would say 2017, 18, uh, many of these offices has been closed, uh, the MOU been uh, discarded, uh, that U.S. M taking a attitude more of, you know, uh, China as a competitor, so we cannot uh, help them build up the uh, capacity. But U.S. have uh, benefited a lot from the uh, capacity building in China, too, because, you know, everyone has uh, flu uh, vaccine, and many of that uh, data is coming from China after China has the world-class um, influenza center. Yeah, if I could add to that, um, I mean, the US has been helping the Chinese collect um, flu data since the 90s or maybe even the 80s. And it's the data that goes into the annual WHO meeting to develop the, the decision for what the each year's flu vaccine will be. It's also the case that the person who led China's effort during Ebola was Dr. George Gao, who's now the head of the China CDC. So he was working directly with his US CDC counterparts and has a very warm relationship with them. And in fact, he called um, Dr. Redfield, the head of the US CDC on January 3rd to tell him about um, COVID. So he actually gave the US sort of an early and direct warning. And we know that Dr. Redfield was very concerned and immediately called Alex Azar who tried to reach the president right away. So the, the communication is still there. I saw a National Academy of Sciences um, conference uh, maybe two weeks back where Dr. Gao was participating along with Dr. Fauci and a bunch of other people. So the discussions are going on, but the fact that the US CDC presence in Beijing went from uh, about a dozen Americans and over 40 um, Chinese specialists to a half dozen people at most, um, including one or two Americans is really, you know, a, a real harm in terms of the government to government cooperation. And we really need both the non-governmental and the governmental cooperation because so much of our expertise in terms of um, epidemiology, in terms of drug approvals, vaccine approvals, all this kind of stuff is at the governmental level. So we need both the scientists working together and the science bureaucracy working together to get the optimal outcomes. And the United States right now isn't even participating in a number of the WHO led international collaborations. And you know, WHO is trying to coordinate um, randomized control trials for treatments. The US is sort of operating outside of that network. WHO is trying to coordinate vaccine trials and then coordinate how vaccine production and how distribution will happen to ensure that it gets to those that need it most. And the US is kind of playing its own game. And that's a real tragedy because the US has always been essentially the backbone of the World Health Organization, providing the largest share of expertise. And, you know, it, as Jennifer just pointed out, it's not just about the US and China, it's about ensuring that the 81% of the world's population that lives in um, developing countries actually gets the protection that they're gonna need too. Yeah, thank you. And, and we have a couple of questions from the audience about the vaccine issue in particular. And since you both have, have alluded to or mentioned that, I wanted to um, uh, bring a question in from Linda, Linda Young who says, you know, noted that 
scientists have noted that COVID, COVID could become a, a seasonal uh, seasonal uh, disease in, in the future, emphasizing the need for, for um, ongoing vaccine production that is possibly done on an annual basis. And even, even if it doesn't, right, this is the, is developing manufacturing and mass producing a vaccine for the world is going to be a huge requirement. And um, just wondering if you can speak to how the United States and China need to better cooperate around that issue. And, and maybe just also if you could address a question from another member of the audience, David Little, who was asking about reports of, 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 of China trying to hack uh, US companies that are working on a vaccine. Of course, there's also been reports of the United States trying to buy German companies that are developing a vaccine. There's a lot of this sort of uh, geopolitics creeping into vaccine production. And I'm wondering if you could speak to the potential dangers of that, that issue. Maybe Jennifer. So I yeah, I would say that um, you know the Milken Institute is have a track of all the clinical trials for COVID treatment and vaccine development. So we have about a hundred vaccine trials globally, uh, and U.S. both U.S. and China has uh, probably have the uh, most numbers of, of these uh, vaccine trials, and they are almost um, you know head to head uh, at this moment. Uh, China has uh, at least three trials that's in the human phase uh, 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 clinical trial, uh, and uh, U.S. have a couple of them uh, also entering into phase one, already starting the phase one and uh, getting into the phase two. So I don't think there's a problem that we have so many uh, uh, trials because uh, we we want to have the scientists to put in their best. And certainly, you know, uh, in the scientific field, they, they will uh, communicate with each other, you know, but uh, this competition is a healthy competition. The question uh, is, once someone has a uh, safe and effective vaccine, who is going to produce that uh, to manufacturing it for hundreds of millions of people that needs it and how to distribute it uh, in a way uh, in the, the most effective and quickest way because every day wasted is there's people you know dying from and there's economy that's been blocked out of the, the normal activity. So that I think is where US and China uh, and uh, other uh, international partners should work together is to, to think about a, uh, how to license uh, these vaccines, whoever you know, got it first or second or you know, the top 10. And then uh, think of work with the multilateral organizations, either it's WHO, G20, or you know, uh, CEPI, any organizations that would put equity uh, into their uh, consideration uh, and uh, to think about a plan to, uh, for uh, procurement, international procurement and dissemination. Um, I think, Deborah, you want to add anything on that? Well, I mean, just one point I've heard um, vaccine specialists make is that there may be more than one vaccine that looks promising. So, I mean, what's going to be needed is the full vaccine produ production capacity of every country that can produce. So, again, I just think the WHO is the obvious place to do a lot of this coordination. And... Um, the U.S. has always had a huge amount of influence on the WHO. The current stance that somehow we don't um, ignores all of history on this one. And if we're worried about other countries having too much influence, the easiest way for us to have influence is to get involved. Other countries actually look for that. And our expertise is well recognized. So I think... Ideally, you know, a bunch of vaccines come up and everybody gets involved, but I do think there's going to be a huge need to figure out how to just ramp up production beyond what we have. And a huge worry that at the moment, um, childhood vaccination is declining because of the diversion of resources toward COVID and also because parents are afraid around the world to engage with the health system to even get their kids vaccinated. So this huge effort that the US has supported with both WHO and UNICEF for decades to get the childhood vaccination rate now up to 85% globally 
runs the risk of declining as we're working on this. So we have so much that we could do and so much that we could do better if we would just work together. Yeah, thank you. And, and one related uh, component of this is uh, the problems that, the unique problems that developing countries face, both in the economic and public health spheres, where they're, they have sort of less depth to be able to uh, confront the, the economic challenges. They, they can't you know, print money without consequence in the same way that the United States can. And, and of course, having less developed public health infrastructures. So Jennifer, could you speak to the, what efforts that China and the United States are each taking place in, 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 in terms of providing aid and assistance to developing countries and dealing with the pandemic? And are those efforts necessarily cross purposes or are there ways that the US and China could better coordinate in this regard? Yes, I've talked, uh, I talked about this issue on the uh, published uh, commentary on health affairs last year and also testified uh, before the Congress on this. I think traditionally uh, uh, US uh, certainly has been one of the largest donor, either through its government uh, uh, agencies or through the individual donors uh, such as uh, Bill Gates. So these are the driving forces for uh, the global health in the last decade. China has quickly coming from uh, change its role from the, the AIDS recipients uh, to a donor recently. So China is still relatively new uh, in this domain. And uh, US China have very different um, uh, approach in terms of uh, uh, foreign aid on health. On China, it, it, it's not uh, new for China to say foreign aid in health because they sent uh, medical teams to African countries back in the 60s and has been sustained uh, that activity for all these years. So, uh, and they also focus on building infrastructures, building uh, hospitals, clinics, uh, and uh, they train uh, the either public health or health professionals. Uh, they bring these uh, physicians and professionals to China and talk about uh, uh, these um, uh, the, on the education side. Uh, they also provide some of the medical supplies uh, and medicine. And finally, there is uh, the hum humanitarian aid that we see uh, more increasingly China's involved with that. Um, but in, in terms of medical uh, supplies, uh, the issue with uh, China's pharmaceutical comp uh, industry is that it's still very fragmented. Uh, they have you know, more than 6,000 factories, but mostly at a very small scale that uh, pro uh, mainly produced for their own province or district. So China has been for years, at least 10 years, two five-year plans, has trying to consolidate uh, these uh, factories and then you know, to, to build uh, regulations, uh, stronger regulations on these. So that's something I think what China government wants, what the world would like to see because China right now is only provi providing mostly the, uh, the uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients, the basic chemicals for, for medicine, not even the gener generic drugs. It does have a 700 million dosage uh, vaccine production, um, but it's mo most of them are only for the domestic uh, uh, market. So I think now may be the, the right time uh, if we want to engage China uh, in producing more for the world is to help China to build up the capacity uh, to have this vaccine and medicine um, uh, pre uh, PQ'd, uh, pre-qualified for WHO's use. So this, I see this as more uh, of a time that China can scale up to help the world rather than to disengage with China. Thank you. So one aspect of the pandemic, uh, one last aspect I want to touch upon before moving on to talk some more about US-China cooperation around climate change is the question that, of course, a lot of American politicians have been directing attention to, which is that of uh, accountability or investigation of how, how the Chinese government handled the initial outbreak. And um, so I want, I want to uh, ask first a question just about, you know, what, what does the evidence say about the way that the Chinese government handled the initial outbreak? And what are, what's the sort of normal course of investigating the uh, origins and, and outbreak of a disease? And how, is that likely to be followed in this case? Is, is the US approach endangering the likelihood of success of such an investigation? 
Um, uh, I don't know, Deborah, if you want to speak to that. So, so I think firstly, um, there are two periods where there's some concern about a Chinese cover-up. The first is in December when some doctors were saying there was a problem. And I think what we had was the typical situation when a new emerging disease happens where uh, there's a lot of confusion that some people say there's a problem, other people say there's not a problem, there's a lot of debate going on and it got locally political, et cetera, et cetera. I, that seems not surprising because it's a brand new disease and nobody knows what the heck it is. There's a second period in the middle of January after the Chinese had already reported to the WHO, they had already called Dr. Redfield, they already were talking about it internationally, where they then closed up for a week and reported no new cases. And I think that was a huge problem, not a huge problem for us, because our CDC had already been warned, but a huge problem for the people of Wuhan in particular because there, that week loss probably was enormously damaging in terms of the number of people in Wuhan that were affected and their own ability to protect themselves. Now, by that point in mid-January, the Chinese had no idea that COVID was transmitted asymptomatically. And remember, SARS wasn't. With SARS, you had a fever before anybody was contagious. And so I think in terms of any idea that this thing could have been sort of controlled before it got out of Wuhan or got out of China, that actually seems quite unlikely because um, the asymptomatic transmission wasn't really confirmed until actually February at least. And we still don't totally understand. And the number of asymptomatic cases, the estimates are all over the map. So the big damage that I think was done was really done to the people of Wuhan. The US was warned, the WHO was warned. In terms of figuring out the origin of the disease, that's usually done by doing biology. And there are really good biologists working on this right now. The best article that we have on this at the moment is an article by Anderson et al. that was published in Nature Medicine in the middle of March, in which they said it's quite possible that it was the, mar the, the animal market that's been accused a bunch of times, but maybe it was that one, maybe it was another animal market, maybe it was another animal source altogether, farms, zoos, there's lots of places where humans and animals interact. They also said it was quite possible that the transmission had happened from animal to human earlier, and then there was a mutation that made the disease much more dangerous, that it had been milder and had circulated in the human population for a while. So they actually left it wide open, whether it was a recent hop from animal to human or an earlier one. There's been a lot of talk about the pangolin, but the percentage similarity between the pangolin COVID and the um, human one is much further apart than with SARS and the civets and the people. So it seems like we don't really know exactly what, where the hop happened or when. Um, they said, yes, there's some small possibility of a lab leak, but we think that's the least likely possibility of those. If it were a lab leak, it would be an accident. They were quite clear that they didn't think it was some deliberate um, concoction, but some sort of experimental accident. But they ruled that as the least likely. And the researchers on that paper have since been quoted in the press saying they're even less they, they're less likely to think that that's what it was. Um, Ian Lipkin, who's a virologist at Columbia University who was on that paper, um, has been quoted in the press saying he's continuing to work with his Chinese partners on this question. This usually takes a long time. It was well after um, SARS had actually disappeared from the planet before the whole civet link story came out. We still don't exactly know where AIDS emerged in Africa, right? So people have an idea of what the animal to human jump was, but we don't know exactly when, we don't know exactly where. So this isn't a, subject for 
you know, legal investigation. This is a subject for good quality biology. And that's going on and it's going to continue probably well after this wave of the pandemic. And hopefully by the time we know we'll already have a vaccine, although that's because I'm really hopeful. Yeah, thank you. So yes, I, I want to bring in a few more questions from the audience and that actually I failed, failed to mention that question was one from Stuart Schomburger. So thank you for that. And thanks for your answer, answer Deborah. And I want to bring sort of zoom out a little bit to the relation of this question to geopolitics and bring in a question from uh, Helena Cobbin, who is, is asking about you know, 12 to 18 months from now, how will the general power dynamic between the US and China, especially if this, this uh, pandemic just continues and is worse in the United States than it is in China, um, how is that likely to affect um, relations between the US and China and, and sort of global balance of power? And, and especially if, if the United States does try to pursue a more punitive angle of maybe trying to uh, retaliate against China for its, its, some of its uh, mis mistakes in managing the pandemic. John, could you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I, maybe I have a few things to say. The, the, I think both China and the United States have mismanaged the crisis pretty egregiously in, in certain ways. Um, and so we'll both come out of this, I think, with some loss of reputation or prestige um, and trust in the international uh, community. Um, you know, um, for the, you know, after this, is, after we pass this, um, I think we're gonna have to do a lot of work to uh, get the international community to trust that we can be, um, that we can handle these kinds of things in a responsible manner. Um, and not, you know, Deborah's sort of very uh, careful running through of the chronology there illustrates an important point, which is that, you know, this is a changing dynamic situation with lots of uncertainty and you can interpret screw ups with like the ultimate amount of malice, or you can interpret them with, you know, as including things like human fear and misjudgment and, um, you know, bad decision making under pressure and this kind of thing, um, and also just institutional problems. And so, you know, if we want to uh, come out of this on on top and uh, with some with something on the other end that is more conducive to constructive solutions, then we should work with China uh, and the rest of the world to figure out how to deal with these things collaboratively. Um, we have to try to subordinate these. Uh, hardline um, uh, conceptions uh, of the U.S.-China rivalry, because uh, as we've seen, they don't actually make the situation better. Um, the manipulation of intelligence um, to try to condemn China uh, is just a perfect example of, of where we'll go if we if we keep with that kind of posture. Thank you. And it seems like one of those issues, of course, beyond pandemics, where the United States and China need to work together the most is on also climate change. I've, I mean, I've seen the comparison that the, the pandemic crisis is sort of like the climate crisis on fast forward. Of course, there's a lot of differences, but in, in some ways, the basic dynamic of the need for countries around the world to work together uh, through collective action to tackle uh, this issue, especially the US and China as the world's two largest carbon emitters is, is really evident. And, and, and one of our questioners asked about this, um, in particular, um, on how, you know, the, the Melissa Cooper asked how the U.S. The U.S.'s non-participation in environmental issues, and and of course our our imminent withdrawal from the Paris Accords, is is can make it difficult, obviously, to make any sort of progress around these issues. Um, but she specifically asked about um, what role that uh, that ASEAN, and, and we you could broaden that to look at other. Um, allies or, or partners or countries throughout the world besides the US and China as they're trying to work, think about how the best framework make progress on these issues. Um, how can the US sort of work not just with China but with the broader global community and try to get back in the game to exercise more leadership on this question? Deborah, if you could speak to that. So I think the first thing the US needs to do is to have a national climate policy for itself, right? And I think if, um, you know, the election in November goes the way the current polls suggest it will, and there's a long time between now and November, so who knows. 
Um, I think that's likely to be the case, right? I mean, the um, constituency within the Democratic Party for um, doing something on climate has only increased. So we'll we'll see, but it seems like it's likely to be something that happens. Because we should remember that while the US pulled out of Paris, nobody else did. And the Chinese have been going along meeting their um, climate obligations under the Paris Treaty, as have most countries around the world. There is absolutely no question that most developing countries could use a lot more help. And the general tendency of the United States to be pulling back from that type of international assistance that was our sort of norm in the post-World War II world has been a real problem, especially because climate change is here. Climate change isn't about the future. Our climate is changing every day. And actually the speed with which we see new emerging diseases happening is part of climate change. And so developing countries desperately need help with adaptation at the same time as countries like the United States and China need to get on the ball and really move forward on mitigation. I have to say this COVID epidemic gives you both some hope and some despair on the mitigation front. I mean, the hope is that people are really starting to see public spaces in cities quite differently. And the number of cities that have turned roadways into pedestrian and bike fares and said they're not going back to making them roadways is actually quite impressive. And while a lot of them are European, cities like Oakland, California have said that they're going to do that. And so there may be some opportunities there, but on the other hand, fear of mass transit has gone up quite dramatically. And while the last numbers I saw for China were that ridership was back to 70% of pre-epidemic levels. You know, roadways were back at 100%. So there's a big worry that, about a shift toward cars. And I do think we're going to need a lot of creative thinking, especially about urban space, as we think about how to feel comfortable and safe in a post-COVID or possibly sort of long-term struggling with, you know, an ongoing epidemic world and that we want to do it in a way that's sort of intelligent on the energy front. And I think that thinking is only just beginning. Well, thank you so much, Deborah. And I'm so grateful to everyone for your perspectives. This has been, I've learned a lot and I think that's a great note to end it on that that all these issues are really interconnected. And I think we have a lot to learn from the current crisis for addressing climate change. And, and a big key takeaway from all of this is that, uh, you know, the United States and China have to be working together on these issues. Um, and there's, there's really no other way to address these existential shared threats that we have. So thank you all so much. And now I'm gonna hand it back over to Trita. And thanks also to all the questioners for your questions, which we could have gotten to more, but we're grateful for the excellent ones we got. Thank you so much, Rachel, and thank you to Jennifer, to Deborah, and John for a fantastic conversation. As Rachel mentioned, once an issue becomes securitized in Washington, that ends up oftentimes being the only dimension through which that issue is looked at, and that would be a significant mistake in the case of China, particularly mindful of the implications that it has on everything else. So hopefully this uh, conversation helped contribute to uh, an effort to make sure that we don't just look at the question of China from a security lens. Um, if you have not already uh, signed up for Quincy's mailing list, I encourage you right now to go to quincyinst.org, sign up for our mailing list so that you can get notifications of future panels as well as our publications. And just in the next two weeks, we will have three exciting panels that I wanted to quickly mention to you. On May 21st, Together with Jewish Currents, we are co-hosting a discussion on the impact of increased anti-Asian xenophobia on both civil rights situation in the United States, but also on our national security. There is a very interesting link there. Panelists will include Congresswoman Judy Chu and journalist Peter Beinart, as well as QI's own Jessica Lee. On May 22nd, we will be having a discussion with Quincy Institute non-resident fellow Elizabeth Shackelford on her new book, The Descent Channel. American Diplomacy in a Dishonest Age. Ambassador McEldowney will join us for that conversation as well. And finally, on Wednesday the 27th of 
May, we will team up with East Asia Foundation in South Korea for a discussion on the South Korean parliamentary elections last month and the implications for US-South Korea relations. Speakers include Congressman Amy uh, Amibera, as well as Dr. Moon Jong-in, who is a special advisor to South Korean President uh, Moon Jae-in. So thank you so much for joining us today, and we very much look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.